Hi, thanks for joining us again for the Aldris Burnson One Question podcast. Um, my name is Jules McKean. I run the global media practice for Aldris Burnson Executive Search out of London. And I could not be more delighted than to be joined this morning by legendary music um, entrepreneur, Kate Young. Um, thanks for joining us, Kate. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited well, to be here. Well, it's very, very, very kind of you, especially on such a sweltering day. Um, Kate is founder and chief executive of the Soho Group. I'm sure many of you will know her work. You may not know that she's behind it because she's renowned for so much art, mu artistic music supervision and talent partnerships within really high-end cross-sector brand campaigns. And she's got the group has got three divisions, music supervision, brand partnerships, and black book for high net worth individuals. I'm sure a lot of what she does, she can't tell us about. But what I can tell you is that the clients that she works with include Nike, O2, McLaren, Jaguar Land Rover, BCCP, Ogilvy, YSL, Ralph Lauren and Savage Fenty. And she started her career as a music supervisor at Saatchi's and opened the agency at age just 25 in 2005. And in a stroke of genius, 2013, Kate saw the potential in a derelict gin distillery and she transformed 8,000 square foot of it into a 12 suite boutique recording studio called the Gin Factory. And amongst others, the studios hosted the likes of Oscar winner, Jimmy Napes, Paloma Faith, London Grammar, and Stormzy. So a really unique and broad set of talent, Kate. And who better really when music is going through both turbulence and quite a lot of interesting developments. Um, who better to answer our question for this season, which is what do we have to be cheerful about? Over to you, Kate. Well, thank you. Thank you for that lovely intro. Um, so from my perspective, you know, within the sector that, you know, I kind of channel within, um, there's a lot to be excited about, in my opinion. A lot of it sits around creativity being more pushed to the, you know, to being pushed to the forefront of campaigns. And, you know, obviously budgets are becoming tighter, but actually it's a room for creativity to really be amplifying brands and pushing through, you know, engagement, inspirational kind of, you know, campaigns where, there's a lot of, um, yeah, engagement and connectivity. So I think in terms of the evolution of music supervision, which yeah. is obviously a core part of what we do, it's amazing to have seen the transition that has come through over the last few years, particularly. Um, you know, supervision was so traditional in the sense right. of very, you know, not one dimensional, but it was the application of music against film, whereas now, it's the application of music curation and uh, production of, you know, a, a whole event. It's, you know, experiential. It could be fashion shows. Whilst I know that fashion shows have always had music as a real driving part of their narrative for any of their of their performances, it's becoming more and more it, like I guess explorative. Um, yeah. You know, for me, one of the best examples I've seen of music supervision was actually the recent Pharrell show um, with LVMH, which was just unbelievably incredible. It was culturally relevant. It was musically beyond creative. Um, you know, that would be you know beyond our wildest dreams to be able to work on projects like that. I think you know. So in terms of the way supervision has evolved, that is really exciting because it's opening so many more doors, and also giving artists a greater platform to really I showcase their their music. And and artists now are brands themselves. So these these types of partnerings are more about brand to brand. It's business to business. Um, you know, it you know, brands becoming talent, talent becoming brands, and it's a nice way to see evolution of music and talent and supervision and everything that comes with it. So even on film scores, there's a much greater appetite for talent to be driving the film scores rather than traditional music composers. Um, and part of that becomes about the branding that sits behind it. For example, Mark Ronson with the latest Barbie film. Okay. Uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity now where there's additional merchandise that comes off the film purely just around the soundtrack. So I think as well, the accessibility on a global scale for markets, you know, you know, it's so much easier now to navigate brands for us on global budgets because we work 
whilst in the UK and putting our stake in New York as well. Um, the connectivity is so much easier now. Um, and it gives us the opportunity to work with bigger artists, the cross section of talent through different territories, the insights metrics, kind of all the back end, you know, the kind of data that we're Which you was know, never the there before, presumably, Kate, oh. a few years ago. No, and that's exciting because I whilst I feel that that's a great support, the the one thing I always feel with anything where it's emotionally connected, whether it's a talent or whether it's music, there's that emotional driver that I think will never ultimately be replaced by data and insights. I think it's an amazing platform and foundation to have, but I think ultimately where brands have that security is making you know better considered choices but with still emotion at the forefront of why they choose uh that song with that piece of you know with, with that edit for whichever campaign it's there's always that human connection that happens with music and that's what music is about and talent is an extension the the talent brand aspect of that is an extension of that emotional human connectivity so that's kind of all the things I'm excited about do you think that um artists are getting savvier now about them you said you know they're becoming brands and that was never really the case before it was quite sector specific wasn't it it was like I'm an artist I'm a musician but now the language of sort of transmedia intellectual property it is across music gaming advertising you know it's, it, it, into tv and film which we do a lot of work in and we certainly see that kind of talent move you know we move talent from one of those verticals to another where it's relevant to kind of get that freshness do you feel that the artists are having a little bit more of a, a voice about them as a brand and does that help them get a bit more upstream in the conversations when they're working with brands about what might work definitely and I think the you know obviously the birth of social media has really provided <laughs> most of this sort of foundational platform for talent to become brands themselves because you know their engagement is all about the impressions on social media you could be huge on youtube but not very big on tiktok are they relevant on instagram or which platform you know based on the type of campaign you yeah. can be so strategic in delivering the right engagement based on the right application of campaign within social media for artists and talent. So that's huge um, to be able to literally pinpoint everything that you do in a campaign within your media buying and spend now. Yeah, yeah. it's so interesting, isn't it? Because music was never, I, I imagine, create not being a musician myself, but I imagine it was never really created entirely in a vacuum because you would be able to try out material on audiences. But is is there a line they've got to walk now, Kate, where it's like, you, we used to say in advertising, you would you have to be quite careful how you use um, qualitative research, for example. If we put, you know, if we asked if we asked a group of people, you know, it would not necessarily, if it's something really innovative, they wouldn't necessarily get it until the end and then actually actually realise that they needed it. Is the same true in music in that, there is uh, so much data available now for artists to be able to test and learn with their audiences. Is there a time where they just need to sort of take themselves off and just do something completely unique and think, OK, I'm just going to give that to the world? It must be quite tricky for them. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, artists, particularly when they're recording, you know, I mean, one of the things about the studios was that it was an incredibly private space. And the one thing that I wanted to have that was the the at the forefront of it all was the creativity and the space to create in an unboundaried way, should we say. And yeah. you know, so therefore I was also very careful about the type of artists that would come in and reside there um, because you couldn't have, you know, a, you know, a certain type of artist that was upset the apple cart, or, you know, it was very, you know, creativity is quite precarious, the environment, and it needs to be very, very protected. And I think 
without that, you know, and having too much um, influence from, yes, you can kind of have things that trend on TikTok, but ultimately all of these things do really start, I think, from a place of authenticity. I don't think artists really go out, um, not true artists, go out thinking, right, I'm going to make a TikTok hit and that's what I'm... These things kind of become a life of their own. And um, and I think that's the kind of, you don't know what's going to engage. And that's the thing about music because we work in sport as well but with music everybody has an opinion on music not everybody watches sport or football or formula one or but with music every single person on the planet can have some sort of emotional connection with something good or bad um that's music it's interesting you touched on the sport there because it seems like music for gaming music for sport the emotion coming back into those otherwise quite sort of you know they've always been emotional environments but actually they they have been not bedfellows until quite recently um are you quite excited about that for sport and how do you find sports companies reacting to music being sort of more front and center than what it maybe was before I mean we work a lot in the formula one space and Uh I think what's interesting now is that that's a space where it's becoming quite um yeah um accommodating should we say or inviting towards a lot of celebrity talent but most of that celebrity talent I mean music is the kind of cool factor it's the it's the the factor that's very you know you can make cultural standpoints with music and I think that's why so many people draw upon music artists um depending on what what it is they're they're working on and and just final final question for me when you think about reasons to be cheerful what are the genres we should be looking out for, Kay? What's going to be the big kind of commercial hit areas or which countries? You know, what do you think? Oh, there's something in that. It hasn't hit the mainstream yet, but that's going to be big. Do you know, it's it's always the things that I think do really well on like your YouTubes and TikToks and then all of a sudden they get signed. And actually... It used to be know- the nightclubs, but that seems to be the equivalent of the nightclub, doesn't it? <laughs> um but I mean I think you know the big players are always going to be the US always yeah. you know you look, at the, you look at the commercial charts it's really difficult to get um you know artists in that in those commercial charts because now there's you know it is monopolized by some key artists and very difficult now to kind of build artists commercially um and take over that those those spots so um but I think in terms of um yeah, what to look out for. I think it's always still going to be the US players always. And yeah, UK as well. I mean, I am I think Grime has a massive part to play in messaging and what the opportunity there is from a cultural standpoint. So I think those are probably the two main, main things. Very interesting this morning hearing um, the jazz, the, the jazz musicians who've won the Mercury Prize in the UK and actually being coming up through the youth clubs. And I, I think it would be really interesting to see whether in a downturn, whether we actually can really invest in the next generation and give them the spaces to be able to do things like that. And of course you're you're doing that at a much more professional level with, with the distillery, but um, it's, a, it's gonna be an interesting time. It always is an interesting time for creativity in the downturn, isn't it? And um, watch this space. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. That was really fascinating. And I've got- mm-hmm learn since my music knowledge probably finished in about 1997 so thank you for bringing me up to date I've got a long way to go thanks a lot Kate thank you so much for having me